Well, with that introduction, we're all family. So, you know, on that note, I, I just I think it's worthwhile to take a second to say, obviously, thank you for inviting me. But um, it's really hard for those of us who organize conferences to do something that both has like depth in an area and captures people from a broad audience. Usually, you have to kind of either do a large conference or you know have kind of a small focus group. So it's a kind of a remarkable thing. So the organizers, particularly Michael and, and Jennifer, have done an amazing job, I think. Um, and I actually, along those lines, have done something I'm supposed to do, which I revised my talk heavily last night um, based on the previous talks, because there are so many relevant points of contact. Um, and so what I'm going to do is talk sort of about some of the work I've been doing that's sort of led me up to the current project. And the second half of the talk is going to talk all about sort of the new stuff that I'm doing. Um, and in many ways, the open question that kind of led me into this area of research was, you know, how do contagion spread? Um, and this is a figure that should be kind of familiar to everyone in the network and in, in the room, right? Um, and you know, we, we say like these are highly stylized graphs. We have kind of a, you know, a, a locally clustered um, lattice network, some rewiring, and then massive rewiring, and this affects the obviously properties of the topology, clustering, and path length. Also, properties of the dynamics. Um, one thing to emphasize is that. When we talk about why select certain graphs or why look at certain graphs, especially leading from models into data, sort of the converse of what Jennifer was talking about, um, there are reasons theoretically why we think these are relevant. Right? These aren't just sort of arbitrary things that we're studying because they're available. I mean, this is a cute model. It's a toy model in physics, right? But substantively, we think spatial models are important. A lot of phenomena that we study in terms of social spreading happen in spatial networks. And we also think that these sort of Casual contacts, which you know, random ties, weak ties, long ties, right? As a category of social structure, also affects spreading dynamics. And that's a meaningful way of interpreting the, the sort of the, the relevant social space. Um, and so, just to make the intuition clear, we've all seen this a lot. But you know, we have two innovators, so in blue nodes. We look at kind of a social contact rule, um, and spreading sort of propagates around the lattice structure. Right, and this is kind of the familiar thing, neighbor to neighbor around the network. And then we introduce some sort of rewire ties. Um, spreading is uh, faster, and then we rewire a ton of ties, and spreading is a ton faster. Right? This gives us some very clear intuitions, and we think well, we're interested in the spread of diseases, we're interested in the spread of you know, information, word of mouth dynamics, we're interested in the spread of behaviors, everything ranging from new technologies to um, social movements to you know, health innovations. Um, and this is where. I want to push back a little bit from the point of view of theory. And when I say theory here, what I mean is a substantive interpretation of what's going on in the individual's head, right? Not from an fMRI scan point of view, but just from the point of view of reasons, right? Why do people make decisions? Why do people um, adopt or not adopt? So from the point of view of a simple contagion, like a disease, right? often just a contact is sufficient. So there's actually not a lot of interpretation from an epidemiology perspective about what's going on in the head. It doesn't matter. Right? Contact is sufficient for transmission. And so all you need to know is there's a link and then it propagates from person to person. Um, and information propagation is sort of similar too. Right? You learn the score of the game. There's not a lot of sort of thinking going on. You just learn the score and you can repeat it to someone else and so on and so forth. And that maps pretty well into those dynamics we were just looking at. Right? But then the, the point I want to push on is when we think about substantive behavior change, right? for any number of behaviors that we may care about in different domains, either you know, adopting a new technology or um, making a health decision like getting a screening or um, trying a new medication um, <coughs> uh, or joining a, a social movement where there may be real consequences, sometimes we need to be convinced to do it. Right? We think the more costly, the difficult, unfamiliar, um, uh, and uh, potentially painful or uh, dangerous the behavior is, the more that social reinforcement is sort of a necessary factor for sort of the decision-making process. And this is where, when I, you know, we talk about theory, we think, well, there are different reasons why this would be the case, right? And we're really thinking, this is doing sociology and social psychology, like really thinking about why it is that a given node in a network would change, right? And so we know we're thinking about really what the behavior is, what the contagion is that's spreading, right? In some cases, um, uncertainty or risk plays a role, right? And as more people do a behavior, the behavior itself is more credible, we believe that this is something that's a good idea. New technology comes along, it's extremely costly. Should we invest in it? Should we invest in a new market? Right? Well, as we see more people do, we believe that the market investment is a, is a good one. Um, normative validation, this is a, has the same dynamics. As more people adopt, we believe that we should do the behavior. 
But the underlying social mechanism is different. So social mechanism is like a technical term in sociology. There aren't that many technical terms in sociology, right? <laughs> um, but this is one of them. And like all technical terms in sociology, it's incredibly vague, right? So this is, this is an attempt to formalize it a little bit, right? This is what that term may actually mean. Um, and so we can say, well, normative validation is the kind of thing where you put people into a situation, and just by virtue of the fact that more people are doing it, I feel pressure. I feel sort of a sense of, of a desire to conform, right? This has been studied a ton in the lab, right? You know, going back to the 50s, um, thinking about this kind, of, this kind of social dynamic. And it's different from a risk or uncertainty dynamic. It's not that we're, we're uncertain, we feel actual pressure. And a different kind of incentive is a straight economic one. So it's not social, it's not peer pressure, it's just that the inherent value of the behavior can change. Right? We think of this with all kinds of complementary technologies, right? With phones, right? With fax machines. With anything where the more people who have the technology, the more valuable the technology is, right? So just the fact of knowing more people with it, Facebook is a great example of that too. More th the fact of people being in that space makes us want to be in that space, right? Um, and so I, you know, over the course of 2007, 2008, 2009, there's a series of, of formal models, mathematical models, that you know, expand on the, the simple um, small world model and take the intuition you know, all the way back to sort of classical sociology and say, you know, if we really think about diffusion processes in this way and assume that it's a simple contagion not a, not, um, versus a complex contagion, we get really different intuitions about diffusion. In fact, for complex contagions where social reinforcement is needed, um, spatial networks actually can do a better job diffusing things faster and diffusing things farther than networks with these weak ties. This is sort of a striking intuition. It goes back to about 40 years in sociology, exactly 40 years in sociology. Um, that we've been saying for a long time that these sort of random ties facilitate diffusion, right? So starting from that intuition, then it leads us into like a natural big question, which so is... When you say small worlds, yeah. are you talking about that model, that's sort of one struggle as they at the extreme limit or yeah, so before that limit? Because if you ask Duncan once, he'd say, that's right. there's nothing interesting at the limit, it's a random graph. It's well, it's not that it's nothing interesting, it's, it's what, what are the characteristics of interest, right? No, but at, and at so, the limit, it's no, a I understand. Graph. Well, so Before that, where there's local structure, that's, that's sort of what you call a small world. Well, there's small world network and small world topology, right? And so Newman makes this clear in the 2000 review. But essentially, the, the point is that uh, if we think of our, our sort of main relevant characteristics as um, local clustering, right? And, and we say, well, is there some value to that local clustering? Or basically, as we approach a random graph, do we just approach our sort of fastest possible? And so this is something I'm going to point out in the next couple of slides. But what a useful, so in, in physics, we have this idea of idealization, right? point masses and stuff like this. Well, in sociology, there's a kind of a, a corollary term, and of course, it's much more vague, but it's called ideal types. And so we say, well, real networks are super messy, but we isolate some characteristics that we think are relevant. So one characteristic to isolate is the, you know, the level of clustering, which in, essence, in essence is the level of redundancy. So if we take it from like the simplest point of view, we say, well, information diffusion is fastest when there's the lowest possible redundancy. Right? And there's the lowest possible redundancy in a network that's completely random. So in expectation, no neighbors, are neighbor, no neighbors are neighbors of each other. And that means that every single contact leads to a new person, leads to a new person, leads to a new person. You get your sort of maximum exposure at each step. Right? And so we say, OK, let's take that, which is our ideal case, and contrast it with the other case, which is where everyone is locally embedded in basically a uniform lattice, which is your other ideal case. And so that's going to be the kind of the way that we frame the next piece of this, just to kind of isolate very. When you say small worlds, there are you talking about that limit where there's no local structure? That's right. Random, that's right. Or right before that limit. No, I'm not. I'm not talking about right. He he identified in the original paper. They identified that kind of special space where there's yeah, both. That's, what you that's right. Um, and there's a really nice intuition for that, um, which is, I mean, there's a lot of deep. There's a lot of deep stuff going on in that paper um, that is that's actually interestingly connected to social theory. Which is that you know they have this idea if you take a first-person perspective, your world kind of looks clustered still by the diameter of the network changes, and it's it's a very interesting intuition. But we're just interested here in the macro-level dynamics, and we're saying yeah, if we were to just eliminate redundancy entirely, right, and get our kind of ideal case for rapid information spreading, what would that mean then for behavior spreading or for complex contagion? So that's the way the question is phrased. So David, is, is your assumption that there's a cost to the contact so that? <coughs> Too much cost or decays the effect? Is 
Oh, no, it's just, it's a simple, it's basically the simple sort of percolation dynamics. So this is a straight sort of macro level Cisco mechanics description of diffusion, right? And it's basically saying, well, if we had our fastest case scenario, assuming a simple contagion, does that also mean that things are equally good assuming a complex contagion, right? That's the next step. Um, and so if we have a prediction, the prediction is, as we assume that behavior is uh, more complex and has these dependencies about social reinforcement, um, that in fact, uh, network structure should affect spreading in a way that's really different from the way that simple contagion is diffused. Um, and this raises the question that, you know, kind of leads us all in this whole, this whole range of research, which is how would we ever evaluate that empirically? So this is a big claim. I mean, theoretically, we've got lots and lots of theory. Again, not just the small world's model, but previously, 40 years in sociology, arguing this sort of point, generally constructed. Um, and then we've also got, of course, massive implications, right? If you design a health intervention, how should you seed it? What should you expect about the network diffusion? If you think the disease spreads one way, do you think a preventative behavior would spread the same way? Or would it spread differently? Does that mean you should look at different kinds of networks than the ones the disease is spreading along, right? So we think about this really substantively. Um, and then this really leads us into the, the problem of, well, how, how would we ever do this? Um, how would we ever study this kind of thing? And you know, one of the points is that we really haven't been able to. Right, one issue is scale. This is really important. So scale is something that matters theoretically. Um, that we have, in, in statistical mechanics, you describe what are called finite size effects, which are exactly what they sound like. So if you run a model with 10 people, you get one result. You run the same exact model, same exact dynamics with 100 people or 1,000 people, you get the exact opposite result. Right, so if you're interested in the dynamics at 1,000 or more at scale, then you just can't study with 10 people because you'll, you'll get the wrong intuition. Um, so that matters, and then of course, if you really want to study how something's spreading, you need to know the real-time dynamics of influence and change. And then you have all these problems that we typically do some hand-waving on, in, in not just in social science, but in science generally, right? We say controlling un unobserved heterogeneity is really, really hard. Um, so we kind of make some assumptions. Um, but these things matter, really. Right? If we want to tease apart these different causal mechanisms, like we, have a, we have a structural theory about how topology as, as an independent variable affects some kind of collective outcome. Um, and then reproducibility becomes very, very important now. Because we say, if we've got that kind of claim, we'd like to say is it doesn't just happen once. Right? And the, the, kind of thing, the kind of thought experiment to imagine is, imagine if we could identify a contagion process. Right? Imagine if, if that wasn't a problem empirically. If we knew for sure it was a contagion process. Would that tell us everything we need to know? Right? And the answer is no. If we watched a, a real contagion process in one network once, there's all kinds of other stuff that could be happening because of the massive interdependence of variables and the correlation of variables like homophily, network effects, leadership roles, and so forth. Right? So if we want to really control that, we need to reproduce it across different conditions. And so that's where uh, internet experiments come in. And one of the things I want to suggest is that this isn't just one method among others. Right? This, is, it's kind of, this is a conjecture. But you know, with the advent of big data, with thinking about new powerful ways of doing lab research, the, the intuition here is that web-based social dynamics or, or internet experiments specifically give us a way of studying the causal effects of these structural variables of, of networks on collective behaviors in a way that we just couldn't have done before. Right? And so the intuition here, this is kind of a, a cute trope, is the social petri dish. Right? So we build a little world, and we put people in it, and we study how they behave. Right? And that's kind of cool because then we can see them sort of grow and change and maybe we get some kind of fungus out of it or maybe we get penicillin out of it, who knows. Right? But then we can do it again and again and again. We can replicate these little petri dishes next to each other. And that gives us like an incredible analytical power. And the point I want to make, and the sort of, I'm going to hasten to contradict myself right now. Right? I want to say, yeah, we can do that, but we could have done that in the lab too, right? So what's different? Right? And I want to say what's different is that unlike in the lab, we're not bringing people into a setting that's an artificial setting. We're not giving them a behavior to do that they don't quite understand or that has really narrow constraints. What we do here is we go to the natural environment. Right? These are sort of experiments in the wild. We're basically going to a space that people participate in anyway. Right? Perfect. Um, and you think about all the kinds of things that people do online, right? and they, you know, they buy stuff, they sell stuff, they date, they download music, they interact, they sign up for health uh, programs. They do all these real things. So if we can just go to those spaces where people are doing real things, we can study their real behavior. Right? And we can study it in this way, just like a, in a Petri dish. Um, so this is something 
uh, I built a few years ago, so science in 2010, and basically the idea here is that, you know, I built an online health network um, and just recruited people from the, from the world, from the universe, right? Who are these people, right? They're not being paid. Why are they coming? This is the, this is the question you should ask yourselves. Like, why do they care? Right? You basically just built something and said, hey, come join the Health Lifestyle Network. These are people who are like intrinsically interested in health and health behavior. Um, and then I you know, built topologies ahead of time and then see, put them in the topologies. Again, if you looked at a lab experiment and said, oh, I built a topology and put people in it, you say, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But as soon as you do it online in like a real world setting, like everyone has this reaction of like, well, wait, you built a topology, but how, why? How, how could that possibly work? That means you put people into a network and said, these are your neighbors interact. Right, when a lab, it makes sense because you're basically being told to do it because you're being paid for some outcome. But in the real world, why do they care, right? Well, they care for the same reason that when you go to TripAdvisor and you sign up for, you know, you want to get a hotel and you see a bunch of random people that you've never met make ratings about hotels and two, three, four of them say, this is a bad hotel, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. You'll change your decision about what hotel you're going to stay at, even though these are completely random people to you. They're anonymous, right? And so in this space, people care about this sort of health information or in, in the in the particular study I, I'm actually doing, I, I actually diffuse a behavior. Um, and when they're embedded in these networks, what they see is this, right? So there's no sense of the network, there's no sense of tie, they don't have, they have no network theoretic realization in this space. It's just a kind of a first person perspective on the world, right? I'm a guy, I signed up, I have my username and avatar with some characteristics. Other people have, have, uh, have username, usernames and avatars with their characteristics. Right? And so when I look at me, I'm like, I know the process they went through to make this you know, profile. And I attribute that same, this is a really interesting point, I attribute that same behavior to these people. Right? I give them full backstories. Right? I kind of manufacture for them meaning in the social space because I went through this process and presumably they went through it as well. And it's amazing to me. Like, I actually controlled all the messages. So they all came from the Health Left Zone Network and said, your, you know, your buddy signed up for this you know, this, this health program that we've initiated, do you want to sign up too? And so that was the prop, it was a real propagation dynamic, but people couldn't email each other because, you know, anonymity, right? Protects for IRB reasons. Um, but people would respond to the server and say things like, have you tried this diet? Or have you, you know, have you, you know, I'm interested in doing this program, have you tried? I mean, they're actually like engaged with these other health buddies as, as people with, you know, actions and reasons and, and backstories. Yeah. No, this is the point, is that this topology here, the one on the left-hand side, well, I'll show you even more clearly. Um, these topologies, the one on the left-hand side that's clustered and the right-hand side that's random, these are, these are constructed ahead of time. So as people come in, they're basically put into a node, and the people they're connected to are the buddies who show up. Then I seed it with a behavior. Um, then it was showing, signing up for this health program. Um, and we can just watch it spread. Again, the beauty of these data, they're just, you know, the science paper just reported count data. Right? There's no fancy statistics here. It's just, let's watch the spreading, which is our, fundamentally our intuition. And we can see that what happens here is that even though these signals are locally constrained, that it generates redundancy. Right? And redundancy creates social reinforcement, which generates sort of a spreading process. And here, the signal is going out throughout the network, right? the simple contagion. People are finding out about it. But the adoption is far less. Right? And this sort of pulls up the movie, like actually illustrates something that is harder to get just from looking at the, the data. Um, which is that this, the diffusion process has kind of a characteristic of kind of neighborhood spillover in the large world. This is a simulation or this is the actual? These are the actual data unmodified. But, but what, what's being adopted here? Um, I had people sign up for a health program where they could you know, share health resources. So it was basically signing up to be a member of this health program. Um, but this is among, <clears throat> I mean the network is this pre-specified topology in which you are dropping down people who, who register for your site, basically, right? Yeah, so there's two steps. People have to come join the study. And then you put them somewhere in this topology. And then you're somewhere in the topology. You're randomly assigned to conditions, obviously, and then randomly assigned but to a so note within the condition. The adoption is not the registration itself, but some additional action. Some additional action. So I had to build, you have to build a series of products, basically, right? right? So this thing is a product. And then within that, you have to build a second product, which is the thing you're going to diffuse, right? And that that eliminates entirely um, unobserved heterogeneity because no one can find out about this except through this diffusion process. Yeah. Do you have a sense of whether it came from the sort of pressure thing you were talking about before or 
Yeah, so that's good. So, so this is where the that's a great question. This is where the mechanisms come in. When you design a study like this, you've got theory, which says we think this should work and why. And the reason we think is, well, in this case, as people, more people adopted this program, there were other people to interact with and to share health recommendations with. And so the, the kind of intuition I had is, well, the fundamental mechanism here is one of strategic interdependence, of complementarity, right? And then that's what's increasing because you can, you can see that more and more health bodies are adopting and it presents the signal that, oh, this is an increasingly valuable thing for me to do, right? But that was, I mean, that's why the theory is helpful is because you're doing the experimental design the whole time. It's like, all right, which mechanism do I think is at work here? And then how do I identify that mechanism with the actual construction of the study? Um, and then the, one of the big punchlines here is, all right, there's 128 people in this network, 128 people on that network, and then I, did, I replicated right, these trials six times. That's what, like 15, 36 people, right? And your question is, what is N? And my claim here is a causal effect of the network on behavior, which means my claim is that there are six observations in each condition. Right, so my total n is 12. All right, and now I can make a causal claim. I can say, well, these are independent. These are IID by construction. And now we can say if there's a difference across every single, condition, every single trial, then we've got a causal effect of network structure and behavior change. Right, it's a new way of thinking, I, I think, about these kinds of diffusion dynamics where we can think really about um, populations as individual samples. And then we can compare them collectively. Uh, and then the nice thing is that we can also dig down to the individual level and remind ourselves we have a theory here about why these collective dynamics should be this way, which is that the behavior is complex, it requires social reinforcement, and we have such good data that we can actually find that. So we've got a micro-level description of what the behavior is and a macro-level dynamic, and they match up very, very nicely. Um, so in a, in a series of papers, then I kind of explored, you know, if we, I did a, a second paper the follow-up year um, that looked at uh, homophily. Again, as a, as a manipulable variable, not as something we discover empirically, but changing, you say, the characteristics and the vector of traits people have, putting people in one network where the vector of traits were more overlapping and similar, which is the vector of traits was like kind of randomly distributed, and saying, well, how did that really affect diffusion? And we have theories, Matt and I were some of the few people actually to have like models of this predicting it, but those models, I mean, they're interesting, but it's very, very hard empirically to really think about what homophily means as a causal effect on diffusion. So there's a, a series of papers looking at these kinds of things, but this has led me to what I'm working on now, which is, you know, real behavior, typically, from like a normative perspective, the things we care about, aren't just things that are seated in the network externally, right? They're endogenous. They're like a lot of us have strategies and ideas, and we kind of learn from each other. And the more that I do something, maybe you react. And your reactions actually affect my interpretation of my own behavior and political opinions this way. Right? And we may coalesce around something, but that's really a process of coalescence. It's not just that something was seated and then it spread. And so the contagion story is, I think, a kind of a narrow subset of the, of the kind of dynamic that we're interested in when we think about social processes, especially when it comes to norms. Think of like linguistic conventions, um, how we all agree on you know, certain ways of talking. Um, of course, you know, terms like spam become classic examples of this. Like, why do we all talk, call junk email spam? Right, why do we? Um, well, because everyone else does. Right? All right, and it becomes a convenient way of talking about it. Economic conventions, standards of fair bargaining. Right? I mean, these are things that are, are basically just established through social interactions. And then once it's established, then everyone agrees on it. Social conventions, there's things about like gender norms, which we've seen evolve in society. And we've seen sort of points of contact, right, where that's actually caused tension. And then as they evolve, then there's sort of a recoalescence around it. And then industry conventions, Web 2.0, and other things like that. Um, and so the game here I want to talk about very, very quickly at the end uh, is, is basically based on the standard model of how linguistic conventions emerge. But there's an object here, and you look at the object, and you say a name, blah. I look at the object, and I look at the name, and I say schma, right? And then we say, OK, you said blah, I said schma. And now we kind of update our memories. Right, so it's a very simple kind of toy physics -y model of like how this might work. And there are more sophisticated game theoretic models like Peyton Young and other people have developed that really kind of flesh out, you know, in some circumstances how we think this happens. Um, and so social norms here are emerging through the endo endogenous interaction, right? And so this is an evolutionary story, right? We've eliminated, you know, leadership from an external source. We've eliminated kind of uh, authority figures driving coordination. We said, like, well, if we just have people interacting, trying to figure out these, these, you know, these answers to like what's the best way to coordinate on it. They don't really care what the world is doing. 
They don't really know what the world is doing, but they care very much what the people they're, they're interacting with are doing, right? And this is driving their expectations. Um, and so this is the name game, right? Um, and along the lines of stuff that was described earlier, so you have a bunch of people who you're playing with, you've got an object that you're trying to name, in this case it's a, a picture of a woman's face, and you've got a series of rounds, and a series of rounds is fixed. Time limit, obviously, you get some winnings for matching. If you, uh, as Michael pointed out, it's hard to penalize people for, for losing, because that's called gambling. Um, but you, <laughs> there are really strict IRB uh, limitations on being able to do that. But you can penalize people down to zero. Right? And it turns out, interesting, people are more responsive to the game when you penalize them versus like just give them no response for losing. Um, so, uh, so here, you know, they get penalized, for, but they have no information about what their neighborhood looks like. And in a given interaction, they don't even know which of these people they're interacting with. So it could be 20 interactions with the same person, or it could be one interaction across everyone. They have no idea. So it's like, really, you have no information about the social world you're in. Right? And the question is, well, if you're just engaged in this process of like trying to repeatedly name, can we actually figure out that problem? And just to show you, some, this is just live data. Um, work, the paper's under progress for submission. So I'm just going to show you some of the live the, um, then I think that the exciting question now in terms of open questions is this approach of doing this kind of research gives way to a, a, just an incredibly large set of questions we can ask right? Um, about these dynamics, about the interdependencies, about all kinds of organizational structures. Um, and so you know, I think this is the open question that I'm very interested in, in how people think about is what, what are the limits of this sort of approach? Anyway, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>